What's up, y'all? Welcome to Convo Blueprint. I am your host, Zion, and you can't see me yet. Boom! There I go. Um, so tonight, I wanted to show my friend's documentary. This was her grandfather right here. I can make that a little bigger so you can see. Um, this was her grandfather right here who was the mayor of Bethlehem. Palestine, 1958 to 1962. So my friend Mary and her husband Atiba watched my show last night that I did about Hawaiians not being able to afford living on their own land. And um, she said there were some parallels between, you know, the colonialism of the Christian missionaries and how 
you know, all of that went down. If you haven't watched that video, please go watch it. Um, and I used a couple of documentaries, a couple of sources that showed what's currently going on and how people can't afford to live here and going all the way back to the history of Hawaii and how it became a state. So she, my friend Mary, has a documentary called Christians of Palestine, Mary Davis. And she also has a Instagram um, with the same title, Christians of Palestine. I think it's Christians underscore of underscore Palestine. Um, and if, if not, what I would do is I'll make sure that after I post the video that uh, everything will be in the comments so you all will be able to find her page. So without further ado, let's get into it. But I always have to start with the meditation for today. It comes from Philippians 4 and verse 6. It reads, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. That was the meditation for today. Another verse says, uh, the most high will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. So I hope that in this time of transition um, that the world is going through, economic things are happening. Um, we're about to, you know, we looked at how Hawaiians aren't able to afford to live in Hawaii. And now we're about to look at uh, my friend's document documentary, Christians of Palestine, Life Behind the Wall. So let's get right into it. We talk today about Bethlehem, the city of peace that lives no real peace. Because any city that is walled, it means no peace is availing. And that is a real challenge, not only for Bethlehem, but for the Christian and the meaning of the Christian message. But if I'm going to talk about the challenges of living inside the wall, as you know, our northern borders is Jerusalem. And so Bethlehem and Jerusalem are a vicinity, whether in the spiritual dimension, they are a twinning on a spiritual dimension or territory. Now the wall separates between Jerusalem and Bethlehem and thus separates between job opportunities, spiritual dimensions, economic dimensions, and that creates serious problems. In Bethlehem today, we live abnormal living situation, but my concern is that the world is considering our abnormal living situation as if it is normal. No, a nation who lives inside the wall, this is purely, significantly abnormal living conditions. We were 98% as Christians in Bethlehem, 98%, imagine. Today, uh, uh, we are less than 20%. Uh, 40,000 inhabitants in Bethlehem, majority of Muslims, and as Christians, we are less than 12,000. And I've been saying less than 12,000 for the last few years, but the number has gone down since then because immigration. The occupation makes it so difficult for you to live here that if you have an opportunity to leave, people want to leave. The reason is the political situation. So I'm going to highlight uh, some of the cons um, the connections. Um, Hawaii and the colonial powers that took over um, Hawaii, they did it in a systematic type of approach. It wasn't just, hey, we're about to take you over. Th there was like a slow kind of like mafia rules kind of thing 
you know, I may not get you. Um, I don't know if you ever played the video game Mafia, um, but they may not they may not get you right away. But years down the line, the plans were enacted, you know, um, like how in the kingdom of Hawaii, they put, um, installed a puppet king who is like they, they allowed the Hawaii to maintain its freedom per se. But under the guise of having a puppet king that was going to do whatever um, the, the, the few wanted, you know, the, whatever the United States government wanted and the people who had influence in the United States government could accomplish. So that's what it looks like is happening here. The Christian Palestinians who were, you know, living behind the wall, as this is entitled, um, they a lot of them moved due to the difficulties of the way they're being treated and the living conditions that they're forced to live in. Politics has become a part of our daily life. Every aspect of our life is related to politics and you cannot really ever isolate any part of your life from it. It's quiet one day or one month or one year and then again there's a conflict. In Bethlehem, as you have seen, we live a very strangulated city. We live a walled city, we live a gated city, and that affects the quality of life. And so with, uh, with the political situation comes the economic situation, especially in Bethlehem, as uh, Christians depend on tourism. And when, when there is a political situation, a bad political situation, the tourists don't come. One out of three young Palestinians if they have the chance to immigrate, they will do. And this is true for Muslims as well as of Christians because of the situation. And that's the problem because all of the people that have the opportunity to leave are the, you know, the only hope of creating more change here. I choose to live here because I believe there is purpose, there is in So that's a key point to bring up. In um, the videos that we watched last night, they talked about how the Hawaiian people, it had been such a slow process of stopping and um, literally making their culture illegal to dance and to sing and all of that, making it illegal by the Christian missionaries who wanted to proselytize and, um, you know, basically get their share of the land. Uh, it sounds like th that's what's happening here. The culture is being squeezed out of them. So nobody's staying who has an attachment to the place because they can't afford to live. So when it came to the Hawaiians going against, you know, those few who were trying to control the missionaries who were trying to control all the resources, I mean, they had the military, you know, they had the United States military. So the people didn't fight back because they had been stripped of so many rights and literally stripping you of your rights. You heard the lady say that, you know, every part of their life is politics. It almost feels like that's what's happening, happening in America now. Like, and maybe it's always been, but it does seem like there is a, you know, a, a political divide where both parties don't understand that, the people in the end lose that if you cheer on the rights of somebody else being taken away what's going to happen when they come for your rights when we allow any human to be dehumanized then you know that same energy can come back to us that same um ideology that we think somebody else to be subjected to can then become subjected to us intention and there is a real desire that peace needs to happen in this land uh, that being an american is something i honor and fully respect and appreciate but also i am a palestinian and i am a palestinian who has deep roots and historic roots in this land who wants to see this land also free from violence to see the same values that i cherish in the u.s the values of democracy and equality and justice that we're still struggling within the U.S., but continue to aspire for and the freedoms that exist there to see them also manifested in this land as well. So now I chose to come back and live here. I went and traveled a lot and then I said, no, I need to come back here. I need to give back to my community. I need to try to make a difference here. But it gets very. 
And that's very honorable. And what I would say is it's very interesting because the colonial powers, colonialism, a, a lot of things that we're told ended, you know, the Crusades and these type of things, they never really ended. They just took a different, in my opinion, they took a different morph. They morphed into something else. And so now in this tug of war about who deserves rights and who doesn't, we're still back. You know, it's literally taking us back to the times in which, you know, the have and the have nots. And 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 how is this acceptable? The the idea of not acknowledging the Imago Dei, right, from a spiritual ex, uh, expression, from a uh, Christian perspective, how do, you know, people who say they serve the, the true and living God not understand that every human being bears the image of the Most High and that should they should be treated accordingly um the scripture says he who leadeth in captivity shall be led into captivity um people like to say the bible uh condones slavery and all these things but i i guarantee you those people haven't truly like dived in deeper to figure out what it really says and what it really meant and in the historical context what it was saying it's very honorable that she moved back but isn't it crazy that like she's another human being? Why should she have to subject herself to not be given the rights that other people are giving based on what? Her heritage, based on her skin color, based on her nationality, based on the fact that she's Palestinian. Why do we continue to tolerate? This is 2022. You know, why do we continually tolerate this? This problem in, um, in Israel and Palestinians and the Israeli government you know, um, boxing out, right? The freedom to self-determination or the right to self-determination is not granted to Palestinians or black Jews over there. Frustrating, so it's doable if you take vacations. We have stories to share it, not to do anything more than to inspire other people because we have a strong faith and that's what helps us to stay alive. When you ask people in the U.S. what do you think of Palestinians, the first word that comes out is terrorist and violent. And this is an affiliation that people make there uh, through their media. When I heard some very negative... Speaking of media, um, have did y'all notice... It, I feel like it was very prevalent in the 90s where um, there was always like in the action movies, there was always like a an Arab terrorist. Did y'all do you do y'all remember that theme? Anybody who's around my age, you know, uh, do y'all remember the 90s movies where there was always an Arab terrorist? And I I started to see these things. Even at a young age, I started to see how, you know, media shapes the mind and how they would show people certain images. So that way, you know, it's sort of like uh, Noam Chomsky said, uh, the media's job is I believe he said this. The media's job is to. Um, design consent for war like to get people to consent to war and i feel like a lot of entertainment in hollywood really did that in the 90s let me know what you think in the comments negative point of view concerning the palestinians i become upset and when i, I also hear about negative aspect about american in america i also get upset okay i would like things to work out so I can love my country, my Palestine, but at the same time I love my country, my adopted country, the United States. Being an American here does not give me at all any rights or any privilege. Yeah. I cannot use my U.S. passport, for example, to go to Jerusalem. I cannot use my U.S. passport to fly from Ben Gurion Airport. Uh, what they have done, what the Israeli government has done, which actually violates State Department law and international law is that in my U.S. passport, which is an official government document, I don't even own it, it's an official document, they have put a stamp in it that has my name in Hebrew and my Palestinian ID number. In a sense, they have transformed my U.S. passport to become a ID card that if any soldier stops me with my U.S. passport and sees it, immediately knows that I am a Palestinian as well. Are y'all thinking what I'm thinking? Doesn't that sound very Nazi-esque?
And, and this is something that, you know, as Americans, we've tried to address here. The American government has tried to address here. And how do you think he would be treated after Israeli soldiers find out that he's Palestinian? And they couldn't get anywhere with the Israeli government to do something about it. Concerning the Christian uh, Arabs, uh, Palestinians, you have professors. You have businessmen, every facet in society, they are involved in it. They are in bad. So this is Mary's grandfather um, that's talking. Thanks. They, I mean, they are very active in the Palestinian community. And uh, the problem now is that the unemployment rate is very high. We have a lot of very highly educated society here, the Palestinians, but we don't have a job for them. So we were owning three big businesses here. Uh, one of them is souvenir shop with a home collection and gifts. The other one is selling organic fruits and vegetables, grocery. And the third one was the biggest business is to sell new square parts for cars and fixing cars as a car mechanics. Uh, to Jerusalem and Bethlehem, this is, used to be the entrance, the main entrance, and the most vivid street for business. It was the best area if you you can ask anyone in the street in the city and ask about racist tomb street how was it before they would tell you we were jealous for, you know, to have one meter square just to have an a, a business there but since 1996 the israelis military decided to set up a military camp hidden this camp behind my building uh, they became controlling on all the high buildings and and use it as a base to shoot as well. And they were crowded here in front of the house and the entrance of the house, so we couldn't have any clients there to come to the entrance of the street. So um, people obliged to close their businesses and le have left, especially this area is to be for Christians, most of them. There are more than 50 hotels in the Bethlehem area. So, and owned by Christian families and the souvenir shops and all these families that work from their home uh, for tourism. So, and guides. I find it very interesting. Um, there's another connection too. I'm not going to add any more videos. Usually I may show like two or three, um, but I really want to highlight Mary's um, documentary. So I'm not going to show any other ones, but in follow-up videos, I'm going to show how Basically, the Israeli government is able to do and treat Palestinians this way, largely because the American Christian evangelicals support all of this type of action. They support stripping Palestinians rights away in the name of Zionist Israel. And I'm not sure what's going to happen to this video that I'm putting this truth out here like that. And I'm not even going like deep i'm not even showing documents i'm just sharing what i know and sharing what i think um yeah because there are other videos on youtube where they talk about vice did it i think um how israel is allowed to get away with these things from the monetary support that conservative evangelical christians give to israeli organizations which then use their military power use their governmental influence and use their um you know their right as a jewish person to then in you know disenfranchise palestinians on their own land hmm of course don't forget us so when tourism is affected they don't come so we don't work and so many families leave because of that when they dig to build the wall they couldn't build it in front of the tree. They were obliged to move it as it is right now, just because of the main sewage pipes on the ground. So we could have an entrance and reopen. So I promise God, we saved our life in miracles to share our stories in order to inspire other people how it is so important to have strong faith because nothing impossible to God. God can do it. From this place is where midnight mass is broadcasted to your country. It's not from the Nativity Church, it is from St. Catherine Church. But when you see on TV, they tell you it's a Nativity Church because of course it's, it's right here, you know, it's in the same place. 
but it's called St. Catherine Church. And uh, because Orthodox celebrate, Orthodox and the other church celebrate uh, Christmas on the 6th of January. And Armenians who have also a place in the Nativity Church celebrate Christmas on the 18th of January. So imagine Bethlehem having three times Christmas. It's fun. It's the longest vacation for kids in school. Uh, of course, kids love it, but as parents, we don't. It's a long, very long, uh, about more than 20 days vacation from school. Most of the uh, Christian uh, holidays, uh, the Israelis issue uh, permits for Christians to be able to enter into uh, Israel. And it's not the same for every Muslim holiday. And many times it's, it's, it's conceived that this is because Israelis try to create tension internally between Christians and Muslims who are Palestinian. But I don't think that that has been a case now. I mean, there are some kind of cultural instances where intermarriage has not really been so accepted. But you find that this is changing with time and nothing that the Israelis have tried to instigate between Palestinian Christians and uh, Muslims has been successful because in the end we are all Palestinians and we're all in the same boat and we are all kind of struggling against this larger uh, oppression, which is the occupation. After 1967, as Palestinians, we had to now, living under occupation, we had to register in what ironically called the civil administration, which is nothing civil about it, which was the, the military apparatus that, the Israeli military apparatus that controlled us as Palestinians. Real talk though, so like, how is this different than what Hitler was, was doing. It just took like a different shape. That could be like a strong comment I'm making. Let me know what you think. But like, how is this really different? It's just a slower process. It's a slower genocide. It's economic terrorism, squeezing the life out of a culture that you don't want on the land so then you can bring in whoever you want to possess that land. Right. The right for certain Jews to come and, you know, return to Israel. And, and one of the mechanisms that the Israeli military has always done to create a sense of division between the Palestinians. So it's one of those like divide and conquer mindset was actually on our IDs, the IDs that we carry that were issued by the Israeli military they put our religious affiliation on them. But it says here religion, and then it says the... the Y'all, yeah, is this not crazy? Mary, um, I would just say you did a great job on this documentary. Um, the things, the issues that they are bringing out like are undeniable, and they're a matter of fact, and it can't be denied. It's not opinion. It's not somebody's word. Like, they're showing the documents, you know, we can look up the history and find and corroborate the stories that people are telling us right on this documentary. So Mary, you did a great job. Religion in uh, Hebrew. So if I went to a checkpoint and I showed them an idea and I was a Christian, uh, they would know. Now, most of the time they didn't do anything, but if there were a few Muslims standing there at the checkpoint and they saw me as a Christian there and for some reason, I got a little bit of a privilege over them. You could imagine the you know, ripple effects of what that would have on, on me and them as Muslims that are stuck at the checkpoint and me as a Christian who passes just because, not respecting me for my faith, but doing it to create tension. If I don't rule, I mean, this is, this is a Muslim, this is a Christian. Let's, let's this time give the Christian more the first thing that comes to my mind is a house divided against itself shall fall. A house divided shall fall. Like allowing these type of things to go on. You know, I'm going to do a lot. Of, there's a lot of homelessness. I'm going to do a lot of stuff about a lot of videos on the economy and money and the like how humanity has been operating since the money system 
came on board since America went away from the gold standard, like the total dehumanization of people, right? Because of how they look or their religion, like no, nothing we do is going to be sustainable as uh, interconnected, interwoven people, a community of humans. Nothing we do is going to be sustainable while these type of things are allowed to go on. I hope everybody knows that. So in America, is it not the same thing? Like what they're talking about is the military, a governmental force creating division or trying to create division between the people. Is that not what we have now? Like in America, it is a rep it is a representation of our political system where, you know, the politicians are against one another, as they say. But what is really being decided and what is really being done for the people? But the people seem to fall for it every damn time and point to one another in the midst as, as to blame, you know, one particular party for what is going on. For all of the woes and the social ills, you know, it's the Democrats fault or it's the Republicans fault. In this case, it's the Palestinians. Right. Or it's the. um Israeli occupation, which it is. But you get what I'm saying, though? Like, if it if the shoe fits, the shoe fits. The truth is, it is Israeli occupation. Just like as in, you know, the history of Hawaii becoming a state, it was, the land was stolen from them. Um, and I covered this in detail because indigenous people largely did not believe in owning land. But that didn't stop the Christian missionaries and the U.S. government from splitting that land up, giving it to the corporations, which, you know, the sugar farmers and et cetera, chopping it up. So that way, everybody who they wanted to profit off the land could do so, just as in what we're seeing taking place in the state of Israel. Privileges and stuff like that. And this has always been part of the policy of the Israeli military and occupation, to create divide and conquer and to create tension always between the communities themselves. Sadly, after the Palestinian Authority came and took over that civil part of the, you know, what the Israeli military had, for some reason they automatically maintained the writing of the religion on the ID cards. And now, of course, it doesn't affect us uh, at all. Another connection, the best way to dehumanize and to continue to dehumanize someone is to get the people who look like the people you're trying to dehumanize to join in on the dehumanization of those people, you know, like get the people to commit genocide on themselves, right, by using people who look like them. The same thing happened with um, Hawaii becoming a state, the U.S. government and those few, um, I don't even know what to call them. The people who ended up owning the corporations who came over here as Christian minute, uh, missionaries, right? They installed a puppet king. So the king was Hawaiian, but yet did not represent the people. Does that make sense? So Palestinians took over, but yet keep doing the same thing because, in my opinion, I don't know, but just from looking at the what he's saying in this documentary, like there are always Judases. How about I say that? There's always a Judas. And the Judas is the people who participate in the dehumanization of the oppressed. To, as Palestinians, because there is no tension and there is no conflict between Palestinian Christians and Muslims. And then we're very happy to say that recently the Palestinian Authority decided to take that out uh, because the only people that actually very good. I'm glad they did that. Look at IDs are still soldiers at checkpoint. You know, I don't need to show my ID here. If you know, if I get stopped, I show my driver's license. My ID is mostly used to cross borders. And so for the Palestinian Authority to wake up and to say, we're going to stop the discrimination at the borders where soldiers begin to prefer one over the other because of their religion. And so I think this was a good move that happened where now when we go to checkpoints, I show them my ID. Of course, if they look into the computer, they could still find out what my religious affiliation is, but it's not immediately just by showing them 
my ID that they could tell I'm a Christian and a Muslim, and they could use that to bring division between us. In 2002, there were a curfew and siege in the whole city, in the Bethlehem city. When I was a junior in high school, there was a major Israeli incursion in Ramallah, and we were under a curfew uh, in our homes for about three months or so. We couldn't go to school. And um, the first uh, two weeks, there was no lifting of the curfew. They caged us at home starting 40 days with the area here. And we, without even, uh, uh, we couldn't bring medicines for the old sick mother. And then they lifted it one day for two hours and they expected everyone to leave their homes and buy all their groceries, all their medicine, all the things that they need from town and return to their homes within two hours without using their cars. At this point where we live. Sounds like an open air prison to me, don't it? I mean, what does it sound like to you? Like, mm. It was the most a um, dangerous point for the crossfire in, in the city. And we were walking through tanks, and the tanks are uh, occupied by, you know, 17-year-old Israeli soldiers who are, you know, whistling and, and, you know, flirting with you and talking to you like, you know, hey, what's up, you know, and, and you're like, are you serious? You're in my country occupying my city, and you're trying to, you know, make nice talk with me? Like, get away from me. But you can't really say anything because they're standing in a, in a tank. Just before the first uprising in 1986, we have been about 85 to 90% Christians in, in the city of Bakla. And now we became 50% till, till 10% in Bakla city. Is it only because of the radicals here and there or it is from the conflict and the war and the curfew? I always like to stress that uh, it wasn't God who promised the state of Israel the land. Uh, it was Lord Balfour, not the Lord God, but Lord Balfour who promised Israel. Yes, I'm definitely going to have to do more videos on this. I agree. And I had a conversation with someone who has somewhat of a Jewish background, and I do not personally believe... you. Israel tries to conflate the state of Israel with the Jewish people and like merge it all into one. And no wonder why, like it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That we see the same thing happening in America. Like there are a number of Republicans in the Republican party that want a theocracy. There are new people who are running for positions like Herschel Walker, um, pastor Mark Burns, these, uh, these people are openly advocating for a theocracy, but the danger in that is it would be just like an Israeli state in America. We might even argue that um, it is already, but they would want to use institutions to, I mean, that's what we see the Supreme Court with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I don't care what side of the spectrum you fall on as far as religion, but the law should not be based on your religion. Isn't that how they say America, they teach us that America was established to, by Europeans who were, um, you know, fleeing religious persecution. So if that's the case and all these people and the Republican Party honor the Constitution and all this stuff, why would they then be for the Supreme Court taking away rights? But if this was guns, though, we got to keep the Second Amendment. Right. Right. And like, you know, I, I'm 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 pro-life personally, but do I think that should be the law? No. Like, no. The law should be pro-choice. And um, and I don't understand like in America why people are not talking about health care at all. Israel, if I'm not mistaken, they have health care. We give them millions of dollars, billions probably in military aid, and they have health care, not for the Palestinian but for the Israeli people. So why don't we have health care in America? Why doesn't every American citizen have health care when we're giving, you know, we got money for wars, but we don't have money for health care. And we're paying more for everything in America than what other people are. American citizens, for example, go to Canada to get um, insulin and some, some other drugs that are cheaper because we pay so much 
in America. I don't want to veer too far from the subject, but it is very interesting because essentially this is what's happening probably in most governments around the world. Well, people are picking and choosing based on what's economically best for the one percenters. Right. Racism may not ever go anywhere because it makes so much money. It makes it, it gives people power because if you create a ra a racist society, then it's always going to be the people against one another rather than the people being against the systems and institutions which support and portray and force the racist ideologies on the people. You see where I'm going with this? So as long as, you know, the state of Israel is is treating Palestinians like they're in an open air prison. Right. There are Israeli people who will continue to support that. Now, there are a number of Jewish people and rabbis. You can find them online who are against the Israeli occupation and against treating Palestinians this way. However, there's probably a larger number of Israeli citizens who support this because they are fed the propaganda, just like in America. Right. Police brutality. It's made a black issue in America. And then people, the oppressed are blamed for the oppression that they live in. And it's just like that makes certain people so much money. So it may not it may not ever go anywhere. The land back in 1917. And I think many people mixed uh, mix biblical Israel with uh, today's state of Israel. And these are two different. Agree. Two separate things. And. When you think about, um, I, I, would, I would define Israel this way. I would try to make this very short. So the idea of any type of racial superiority or supremacy, I think is so far from the truth, right? It's so far from the truth. So the Most High chose Israel to be his own set apart people. When humans hear that, right, they think some humans hear the supremacy in it. What I hear in it is that the Most High established an order and a culture for his people to live by and then to take that culture everywhere else because it is a culture that will produce the same way a culture that produces is farming, right? Like seed, you put it in the ground, you water it, you prepare the, the ground and all that, and it's going to have a harvest. It's good. A harvest is good for everyone, right? We could argue a harvest is good for everyone. So therefore... Israel was the most high seed in the earth, right? That he wanted to scatter abroad, have it be planted. And then there would be a harvest for everyone because the culture that he told them to live by is a culture that would support the harvest for everyone. So the lack of um, understanding when it comes to that, I believe um, since it, since it didn't work out that way, right? A quick synopsis of all this is the fact that the Most High sent his only begotten son, Yahushua, down to earth to show us how we should live and how we should be like him and minimized the Jewish commandments that were like 630 something, 635 or whatever, right down to two. And the Most High came to, to fulfill the law because when um, Yahushua came to fulfill the law and he was sent by the Most High because anytime the law was broken, um, the only thing that could, you know, be done at that point is is death. Right. The sacrificing of the animals, um, you know, these type of things um, and people being stoned and put to death and all of that. Um, Yahushua was, came and fulfilled the law. Right. He said. They were asking Yahushua, what's the most important commandment? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, the second is like unto the first, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So in Judaism, in Christianity, like how is that not the main thing? But yet we see that there are different branches of Judaism. There's Messianic Jews who believe Yahushua is the Messiah. There's Christians who follow the Bible and believe the Bible. And then there are conservative evangelical Christians or, right, there's these different branches who pick and choose who's worthy and who's not worthy. And that's a real problem. That's a real problem. 
categories that one should not actually uh, connect. The Israelis want, wanted to be a Jewish state. And the Palestinians said they will never recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Why? Because they have already recognized Israel in 1993. They also are called, you know. My people are hoping that this agreement, which we are signing today, marks the beginning of the end of a chapter of pain and suffering which has lasted throughout this century. My people are hoping that this agreement, which we are signing today, will usher in an age of peace, coexistence, and equal rights. Uh, but Israel insists on the Jewish state, and the, the Arabs who live within Israel also against the idea of making it a Jewish state. They want it to be a democratic state, a democratic state, Israeli democratic state for all its citizens, okay? Imagine that you have a pizza pie, and the pizza pie is divided into 10 slices. And there are two people fighting over this pizza pie, and both people claim that the whole pizza pie is theirs. And both people have legitimate arguments to say that this whole thing is ours. But because of the fighting, for so many years, they decide to divide the pizza pie between them. Now, one group is actually stronger than the other. And they say, well, because we're the stronger, we're going to take eight slices and we're going to give the other group two slices. This is what the Oslo peace process was about. The people who get the two slices or who were promised the two slices are so weak and so hungry that they say, I'll take the two slices. Just you could take the eight. I recognize your right to the eight. Just give me the two slices and I'm fine. Well, the person who took the eight slices and already has them now in his fridge saying, I'm going to give you the two slices, but I'm going to give you the two slices incrementally over time. Fine. Give me the two slices over time. Just give me the two slices. The challenge we have, and this is what the settlement issue is, is that as the person was giving us the two slices, they were nibbling off from the two slices themselves and eating them up. So we're now in, uh... and that is the very interesting part, right? And and how, you know, how the settlement. I mean, even America says the Israeli settlements are illegal. Um, Obama, President Obama, did, and it's just like the land. You know, I, I, there's. Um, I'm gonna have to do another video on this. There's. Uh, basically, people can, if an Israeli Jewish person who's Jewish by the government standard, if you are Palestinian, they can come and claim your home with no reference, with no documents. They can go get a, a court document and basically come and live in your house and either kick you out or be a squatter in your home. And the way that that like that is insane to me, you know, and I or I cannot imagine looking at my house through a fence, but not being able to go to it because the military decided that I can't come through the gate. You know, maybe I got hurt while I was out, you know, um, working with the olive trees or something. And so I didn't make it back in time to cross come through the gate by five o'clock that day. Let's say that was the time. You know, and now I can't get to my house because I didn't make the time that the military said I was supposed to make. Once again, like it's an open air prison. And that's the real issue also. So not only did they, you know, incrementally give the two slices, but then renege on the deal and expand into settlements. It's like there's a continual oppression while doing all of these things as well. Uh, Kremizan Valley and it's actually uh, known as the last green area within the governorate of Bethlehem that hosts around 200,000 people. Kremizan Valley also hosts the last winery and the last seminary of, uh, for Christians in the city and upon the Israeli uh, plan to build the, seg the separation wall, the segregation wall actually, uh, this area is completely uh, designated to be uh, disconnected from the Palestinian side, or let's say from the community that it serves, from Bethlehem community. 
and it's upon the root of the wall it will be separated to the western side of the wall that means that you we will not have access again to it as a green area which is again the last green area in Bethlehem and from a psychological perspective that's very much needed if you want to maintain a healthy community or if you want to even grow a healthy community people if they lose their attachment or connection to nature they lose the humanity somehow and this is the challenge with the settlements it's not just a fact that there are buildings that are present it is the, the idea and the concept of confiscating land taking over land building networks of road that only connects the settlements to each other which only means Israeli Jews can travel on them we as Palestinians cannot taking the resources of this land and presenting a continuous presence of hegemony and power over those who are not part of that group of people exactly what i was talking about so ensuring that like it's kind of like the first example that came to my head right now was like the george george floyd thing the george floyd murder where you know derek chauvin continued to drive his knee in the neck of george floyd for over damn near 10 minutes he was already on the ground he was already subdued right the palestinian people already don't you know have to live in these oppressive conditions but you just keep making it worse by increasing the settlements and like could you imagine right not being able to you constantly being boxed out of society it's kind of like you know being non-white in america you know the amount of discrimination i i think um science has come out and talked about how you know, heart disease is one of the biggest killers for African-American males next to police. Just saying. Um, and I think they have connected the fact that, you know, when people go through traumatic experiences like this, to live in a constant state of oppression um, or to live in fear of your life all of the time, it, it ages you. And those stresses, like you can't, you can't shake those. Um, you know, if you're black in America, when you see the police lights, you know, behind you, you don't know if you're going to make it out that day based on the day that the police officer is having. This is just the reality for a Palestinian. They don't know when when, you know, their religion was on the passport. Right. You get the wrong Israeli um, soldier and that could be your last day. It's the same way that, you know, Palestinians are being treated in Israel. Technically, um, parts of their land. You know what I'm saying? I think it's the same disrespect that Native Hawaiians can't afford to live here. But yet Mark Zuckerberg, the saying, can, you know, take the Hawaiian, can sue the Hawaiian people so he can buy the land. You know, where very wealthy people can buy hundreds, thousands of acres of land and the native Hawaiians can't afford to live here. They can't even afford a two bedroom apartment because jobs here are not paying enough. Is this not insane? This is what the settlements is in its core. It is an expression of the discrimination that we as Palestinians continue to face from the overall occupation itself, but it is the most present in our face expression of this occupation the settlers came from all over the world now this is the interesting part right so when you think about critical race theory so in american politics the republicans made critical race theory this huge thing tried to reframe it make it into something else that it's not um for their purposes critical race theory would actually study you know how the israeli government is using the court system to continue to oppress Palestinians. Critical race theory does not focus on um, groups of people as in the group being the oppressor, but the ideology of the oppressor and how the oppressor uses governmental institutions. So at the government level, how are these, if the government wasn't for it, this wouldn't be able to happen. If people in the government weren't for this, they would not be able to use the court system to then steal land, steal homes, and utilize the military and law enforcement to infringe upon the Palestinian people the same way it is in America for non-whites. 
if you were living in your home in I don't know Estonia or uh, Russia or whatever and someone says to you why don't you come uh, to uh, this uh, area this to Israel and you can get a home you can get startup money you can get a job you can have your kids put in school for free you know of course they're gonna say yes all the settlements around Bethlehem are almost and let me say something too because I don't want to make this like you know, bash white people thing or make it seem like white people don't experience discrimination too. I was meaning more often, right? More often. For example, in the last uh, few weeks, right? I saw two stories. One story where a guy was in prison and um, he basically served like 60 years. And I don't know if y'all have seen it. He um, rode his motorcycle on Route 66 and he got this huge special. I don't, I don't remember if, if he committed the crime or not, but um, basically he was let out of jail. Another black man for one and a half ounces of weed, his life sentence was upheld. And it was crazy because I saw these stories like within a week of one another. And so this is the type of, this is what I mean, you know, when I say like, non-whites i'm not saying white people don't experience discrimination but generally speaking the people in america who are making all of the rules right like what has been the status quo in america for so long i mean the marine corps is for after 246 years the marine corps is about to have their first black four-star general in 2022 y'all like you see what i'm saying though so I don't want to make it seem like I'm bashing white people or that I'm saying white people don't experience discrimination because I know they do. However, largely institutions have been used throughout American history to inflict on, upon those who are non-white. Most connected and creating a circle that uh, enclaves Bethlehem. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reality that exists right now. But this is also a reality that challenges the old identity, the original identity of Bethlehem and Jerusalem, for example, where they were never separated as cities. Jerusalem has always been a city that has been conquered. And the challenge is that every time it's conquered by any nation or any group of people, any religion, immediately there is discrimination and there is undermining and there is marginalizing of the people that are not part of that group. For me, as a West Banker, I cannot go to Jerusalem. If you just drive from Ramallah to Jerusalem, it would literally take you 10 to 15 minutes. But because of the Israeli occupation, if I do have a permit to allow me to enter into Jerusalem, uh, then it's going to take me at least 40 minutes, 45 minutes, if there is no traffic at the checkpoint. If we pass the checkpoint and go anywhere, we cannot drive there. We have to walk. As a Palestinian, if I do have a permit to cross into uh, Israel, then I can only cross through Kalandia checkpoint. Not only that, but I have to go through the pedestrian uh, walking entry into the checkpoint, and I cannot cross through uh, by car. We are still are not be able. To this is crazy, man. Like just to see the occupation of it all, to see people herd, herded like cattle. Um, and I think it's very the same way I feel like overturning Roe v. Wade for Christians in America, the the Christians who would want over, um, Roe v. Wade overturned. Like I called out the hypocrisy in the sense that once those children are born, like these Christians are majority of these Christians, the conservative and evangelicals are not for social programs that are going to help those who are in need be able to afford that child, be able to afford formula and the different things that a child needs. They like, they wouldn't be for those social programs. So I'm like, you know, and I, and I'm not, I'm saying in general, which is kind of hard to do. Right. But from what I see from conservative evangelicals, you let me know if I'm not seeing it uh, correctly, but from what I know from conservative evangelicals, um, they do not support state sponsored programs which would help children you know why 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 aren't christian evangelicals right it would be more suitable to focus on fixing the foster care program or 
or or um why why aren't they concerned about health care you know you see what i'm saying like medicare for all why why aren't conservative evangelical christians using their power to create a more equitable society right just because to just say like and how can how can pro-lifers how can you be pro-life but then think the death penalty is okay I feel like there's some hypocrisy there. And I'm trying to get to this point right here. It's kind of a strong one, so buckle up. But to me, for this can, I, I wonder, I want to meet some older Jewish people who went through the Holocaust. I'm gonna look, I'm gonna do a couple more videos on this. I'm gonna look for a documentary where they interview people from the Holocaust. And I wanna see, It's probably it might be hard to find, but if you can help me find it, that would be great. I would love to see what those people, the Jewish people who went through the Holocaust, what did they have to say about the Israeli Zionist government who is occupying Palestinian territory and literally doing the things that the Nazis did in the, in the arena of, you know, it didn't start with just gassing people. You know what I mean? It was a gradual it was a gradual burn. It was a slow burn to get to the genocide. You see what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't like, oh, we just wake up in the morning. Now we're gassing people. It was, it was these type of actions, the continual dehumanization of a certain people over and over and over again, over and over and over again. And then it got to the point, you know, of gassing people and all of that. So I would love to see what older folks think of what the Israeli state is doing right now. To pass the, the Israeli checkpoint without a permit because we cannot get it. I wasn't lucky to get it this year or this Christmas. There are these Christian Zionists who still actually use the Bible as a tool for injustice. And I believe that the Bible actually is a tool for justice. And it, it was a book written under occupation. Um, as a sign uh, to look for God who helped people out of captivity into the freedom. And I think this is the main message of the Bible. It's not to oppress people, it's to liberate people. So I designed this nativity with a removable wall. This is my design idea. And I opened the door here for the light where Jesus lay. Because the wall has to be removed from the Holy Land. That's my belief. So I designed it and I with a watchtower as well. Because the wall will be removed one day because this is a Holy Land. It has to be the example for peace and light because this is where peace and light started. I would like to see my grandchildren and I like to see my everybody's grandchildren to live in a peaceful setting, I think a peaceful setting, a permanent peaceful setting, a just and lasting peace will encourage Once again, this is uh, Mary's grandfather. Encourage people to stay on the land. So for the Jews to control Jerusalem automatically means denying of rights for the Christians and the Muslims, even for the best of intentions for that. And if the Muslims do the same thing, the same thing will happen. And so Jerusalem needs to be a respected city, a holy city, for the three religions and needs to be honored in that. And the three religions need to play an equal role in determining the presence and the future of that city. Palestinians need to get the recognition of pain. So this is even an example right before us how a theocracy doesn't work because even within, even if these weren't um, different religions, right? Like even in Islam, you have the Sunnis and the Shiites, right? Like, I'm not sure if um, that's just a different culture or if it's just a different um, belief. Um, see, you know, I got some reading to do on that. But my what I'm saying is when you try to add, like, to say America is a Christian nation, which Christian is it? Is it conservative evangelical Christian? Probably. Um, or is it progressive Christianity? 
or is it, you see what I mean? This is the problem when you try to use faith as, um, how about I say this? I got the perfect sum summary of what I was just thinking. The Most High reminds me all the time that when he sent his son Yahushua down to earth, Yahushua was not trying to overthrow the Roman government. And Israelis need to get assurance of security. And that can only happen if both sides come to mature over the national identities and religious identities they have and see that actually they can coexist as identities together and they don't need to conflict because this was the reality to some extent before 1948 and therefore that time when we have people who are together in oneness at that point we can have peace basically in the rear end i would say this too one of the reasons why I believe that I have found the truth is I feel that the way I live my life and my faith is the truth because I'm motivated to love, not judge, right? We all judge. We all judge right from wrong and what we would do. So, yes, that human aspect. But I would add a different tone to it as well. I would say not condemn. Because when you condemn, I think that that's the fastest, the quickest way to dehumanizing someone else. And the reality of dehumanizing someone else is you're really dehumanizing yourself. We're all part of the same human family. So I think that I have the truth because I'm motivated to love. And the scripture tells me that God is love. And it, it is not love to dehumanize another person who bears the image of God. We are part and parcel of humanity, and that's why when I say, as long as the Palestinian-Israeli conflict does not stand on a justified solution, that brings goodness, that brings mercy, that brings justice to all of us, Palestinians and Israeli, we fail. So Mary was the executive producer. My friend Mary, you did a, an amazing job with that. Um, if you join the stream, thank you for um, watching. And I just want to say thank you for liking and subscribing and sharing. And also, if there's something, if you ever want to come on the show with me and have a conversation about something, hit me up in the comments. If there's any type of show that you would like me to do hit me up in the comments um in the about section of my youtube channel um there's all the links there if you're on twitch i also have all the links there and um i guess i will catch you in the next video i'm definitely going to do some more about um, what's going on with the israeli state and palestine it's you know and the palestinian people uh, it's, it's very unfortunate that these kinds of things are still happening in our world in 2022 and we're not doing much about it. So I appreciate you for joining the stream. Thank you for watching and I will catch you in the next one. Have a good night. Have a good day. Have a good morning. And I'm out.